Um, so uh, yeah, computation broadly describes uh, the work that I do, the approach I take to human memory. Um, and uh, in particular, I spend most of my time thinking about the hippocampus, and probably most people here have a, a background on that, but I want to do a quick um, run through the standard um, introduction. Um, and that begins with uh, um, my PhD, actually, just as I was uh, wrapping up my thesis in Toronto, um, I had it in my head that I wanted to do a, a bicycle trip across Canada. And so I was getting my bike ready and I had like my tickets and everything already booked because I thought, you know, it takes a long time for supervisors to read a thesis. And so like I could submit my thesis, do my bicycle trip, and then make revisions by the time they've read it like at the other end. So that was my plan. Um, and, pardon? Well, I have to get my bike to one side. I wasn't going to go both ways. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, you know, then the date came, and I actually wasn't quite done my thesis. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was in a rush to try and get across the country, and I nearly got very much in trouble with NSERC in terms of my postdoc. Anyway, that's a different, longer story. Point being, uh, that trip, uh, which did happen, took me past Ottawa, and uh, I have a vivid memory of visiting the Parliament buildings and feeling like that was a very like definitive point along the along the route. So um, that's an episodic memory because uh, it happened at a particular time and place. Um, but of course, I also had a general concept of what the Parliament buildings were and what they meant in Canada, uh, and that's a semantic memory um, describing generic knowledge that I had available. I couldn't tell you the first time I learned about the Parliament buildings. There's not a particular point in time and place, so I wanted to make that distinction. And of course, we attach episodic memory to the hippocampus. Um, now, um, that reason for attachment uh, arises from a few different fields, uh, one being neuropsychology, um, of course the uh, famous patient HM having trouble recalling events uh, from um, early or more recently in his life, also doing poorly on um, uh, tasks that involve remembering lists of words like these and then um, repeating them afterwards. Um, another, uh, and sorry, this patient uh, experienced those deficits, uh, we believe, because he had resected hippocampus. Um, Another source of evidence is behavioral neuroscience and uh, tasks uh, like the Morris water maze uh, in which a rodent is in a large bin. Uh, it's got murky water. Um, it wants to escape this bin. Uh, there's a hidden platform somewhere underneath the surface and if it swims around randomly long enough then it'll find it and stand on top of it. Um, and uh, that's called escaping the maze. Um, and then on subsequent trials, uh, if you were to do a sham lesion on these animals, uh, they would swim straight to that platform and they'd probably be localizing based on landmarks that exist in the room just because uh, the room has idiosyncratic features in different places. Um, but if you lesion the hippocampus of rodents, um, they swim around just as randomly uh, as if they were experiencing it for the first time. So more evidence that this is important for this kind of memory. Um, I'm interested in whether there are further distinctions. And um, without getting into how I started uh, really thinking this way, um, I got into uh, wondering about um, the anterior and posterior parts of the structure. And some of my imaging studies, um, I just kept seeing that uh, they were responding differently in, in various tasks in ways that were uh, uh, pretty conspicuous. So I thought, well, um, why don't I try a, a volumetric study and see if um, these could be predictors of, of memory. And around this time, um, we were uh, finding in the literature, uh, prior reviews had revealed that like the whole hippocampus was actually a pretty poor predictor uh, across memory experiments among healthy people. Sure, if you looked at older adults, smaller hippocampi tended to reflect better, I mean, worse uh, memory because they corresponded to more atrophy at that time, but just normal variation among healthy people wasn't a good predictor. So um, measured, people's hippocampi uh, in a few, and as well as memory in a few different ways. Um, this was really just being opportunistic and asking friends who had cool data sets if I could um, use the anatomicals that they were just using for uh, registration. Um, and uh, then tried to regress those volumes uh, against these memory measures. Um, and when I broke up the hippocampus um, using just the posterior part, um, 
And we would segment it uh, at the uncle apex, um, which is a uh, um, fairly clear landmark that's um, broadly used now um, to distinguish these segments. Um, what I'm going to show you are, are points from uh, four different studies um, that I tried to use simultaneously uh, to fit a hierarchical model because of the fact that individual studies were, were getting quite inconsistent results. And I found across all those studies, the posterior was a positive predictor and the anterior, strangely enough, was negative. And if you put them together, then those opposing effects appeared to um, muddy up the whole result and uh, you got these inconsistent or null correlations. Um, I had a few uh, digit span measures from those studies, so I used that as a control measure. I found it wasn't a very good predictor. Um, so uh, from this, I started thinking, okay, the posterior must have some interesting special role. Um, but I wasn't the only one who was uh, thinking about the hippocampus in this way. Um, there were many different dichotomies that had been um, proposed, and uh, many of them are still entertained. Um, for instance, um, that the anterior was an encoding region and the posterior was retrieval, or that uh, the anterior is about emotion and uh, this is a prevailing view in behavioral neuroscience today, uh, whereas the posterior was more cognitive. Um, and so on. Uh, there isn't really uh, a way to resolve all these different points of, of view. Um, but there is the question of how all these different dichotomies could exist. This is one structure. So how could one structure have like so many different proposed um, dichotomies within it? And uh, so I turned to the anatomy and uh, observed that the hippocampus is mostly parallel circuits along its long axis. So dorsal, ventral, and in, in rodents corresponds to uh, posterior, anterior. Um, and anterior is not talking very much directly to posterior parts. Uh, in order to have any kind of long axis communication, information has to go out the cortex and then uh, be um, represented there and then find its way back to the other structure. So um, that lack of internal, or, or that internal compartmentalization of sorts may create circumstances that would help um, um, lead to dichotomies. Um, but we still have to actually make the processing distinctive. So one way of uh, explaining that is that there's different long range connections of the anterior and posterior. So here in green, I have um, targets and cortex that are primary targets of the anterior hippocampus. Uh, in blue, the posterior, and then in this light blue is a sort of shared area. Um, and uh, by virtue of talking to these uh, different parts of cortex that are performing quite different roles, um, you could imagine that uh, the memory system uh, looks rather different uh, as a result. So that's one possible link. Another one is that um, anterior and posterior have distinctive compositions internally, even though they're made up of all the same subfields, uh, the subfields exist in different proportions. So um, just a quick introduction to these subfields. Um, CA3 is a subfield in the hippocampus that uh, is represented by this red line. Um, on the x-axis, we have changes in input. So um, if you change your stimulus a lot, you end up on this side of the graph, or just a little bit over here. And this is the change in how that output looks for that same subfield. Now, what you can see for the red line is that uh, if you change your input a little bit, the red region, CA3, really doesn't care. Like, it is um, ambivalent to this change until you hit some breaking point, and then it's like, okay, this is a new situation. Um, we're going to uh, respond to it accordingly. By contrast, dentate gyrus uh, is really sensitive to small changes in the input, um, and that will cause it to represent the pattern differently. And so this is why people often talk about dentate gyrus as a pattern separation region. It's trying to split apart representations and so anterior and posterior have a different ratio of these subfields. The posterior has more dentate gyrus uh, to CA3 than, than does the anterior, uh, which could tip the balance and cause posterior to be more of a, a splitting region and the anterior to be more of a, a completing region. That's, that's one possibility. Um, another observation is that um, perhaps arising from these properties, um, the spatial receptive field sizes of anterior and posterior are quite different. So uh, rodents running along a linear track, I, I love this study, um, 
published in 2008. Um, here we're recording from a neuron which is uh, in the, the dorsal hippocampus or similar to posterior in humans. Um, and this neuron is totally silent when the rodent is running in this direction along the track. But when they run the other way, there's this tiny section of the track representing about 8% of its length uh, where that neuron fires like crazy uh, and then is quiet again. Um, by contrast, um, neurons sampled from the um, ventral part of the hippocampus uh, were broadly responsive. So it, running in this direction uh, got a very wide, slowly amplifying um, rate of responding from the neuron until it hit a peak about midway down the track. And then it also responded going the other direction. So it wasn't even selective to, to direction. Um, but as they point out here, it's responsive to about 80% of that linear track. So um, I think this fits with the idea that it's um, more uh, forgiving in terms of changes in the input. We could maybe map that onto this whole segment of the hippocampus um, of the anterior portion. Here's another anatomical distinction. Uh, in the hippocampus, uh, there's neurogenesis. Um, it's related to the uh, choroid plexus, of which there is more in the posterior part. Uh, we know that in um, rodents, there's also more uh, neurogenesis in the posterior part, perhaps as a result of this relationship. Um, so that's this uh, sort of black stuff that sits on top of the, of the structure here. Um, so uh, if there's new cells being born and potentially incorporated into the structure, uh, this could change the memory dynamics. Maybe the structure is um, uh, able to use this turnover, um, these new cells, um, in creating representations in a different way than the anterior. So uh, those are a few um, anatomical features that could create compartments and within those compartments, different computational environments for interior and posterior that might explain how it's even possible to have these dichotomies that exist within the same brain structure. Um, and I like this idea of the spatial receptive field gradient um, applying perhaps to cognition more broadly, that maybe um, there's uh, something we could say about um, this being used to represent memories, that you have like small memories and like big memories. And so uh, we refer to those uh, scale considerations as just and detail. So um, uh, a question pursued in my lab is um, whether episodic memory, since we believe that's really what the anterior or the hippocampus as a whole is still contributing, um, might help better distinguish um, these, these um, segments in a way that could satisfy uh, a lot of the studies that have been used to um, uh, generate new dichotomies. So maybe we don't need quite so many. The problem here is that GIST is pretty slippery. Um, it's easy to define GIST in lots of ways if you take it um, to various domains. Um, and so uh, what my group did is to um, try and find a, a, a number of characterizations of what GIST could mean. What, what might it look like if we take a large receptive field size and apply that to like remembering an essay or uh, remembering what somebody looked like. Um, and so I'm gonna run you through a, a series of little experiments that we did um, regressing into your hippocampus volume against various quantities. Maybe we'll find one where it's not negatively predicting memory like the original study I showed you, but is actually uh, a positive prediction. So um, the first one of these is um, a study that involves natural sequences and um, this, was a simple slideshow experiment where uh, we start at first with people watching a series of uh, images. There's a, a verbal narration over top of these. It tells a little story that's um, usually pretty boring and then um, either uh, immediately or the next day, uh, participants are given two minutes to briefly describe um, what happened in um, every slide in as much detail as they can. And as a cue, they are given the uh, location that uh, was initially presented with that slideshow to, to get it started and set the context. Um, so uh, to define GIST in this study, um, we had to develop a scoring procedure uh, that would make sense. Um, 
we worked with some earlier frameworks um, such as those developed uh, for purposes of emotional memory and fuzzy trace theory. Um, and we define slide gifs as just information that, that uh, contributes to the meaning of, of a particular slide. So if you didn't describe this or if you changed this information, it would change how we can understand what's, what's going on. By contrast, detail information in these is auxiliary to meaning. So if you were to make a mistake and say that um, uh, the fireman uh, was wearing um, a blue jacket instead of a beige jacket, uh, it doesn't particularly alter uh, the, the gist of, of what it is that has um, taken place. But we came up with a new category to accommodate a phenomenon that we were uh, interested in our participants, which is that some people would spontaneously generate these little summaries. Um, they would uh, say something that, oh yeah, so this is the slideshow where like this thing happened. And then they would maybe go into discussion about what actually happened slide by slide. Um, because this also felt like gist. It's just a different kind of gist, maybe a level above slide gist. Um, and then we made sure that our readers could agree on this stuff. So um, here's what memory looked like um, immediately in the next day. Uh, there was um, some forgetting in slide gist, but people remembered a respectable number of, uh, of those. Um, likewise with slide detail. Um, but this curious central theme property went the opposite direction. Um, and uh, in trying to understand consolidation, um, you know, often we're looking at this in terms of like, what are the types of memory that like are forgotten less? So I think it's really interesting to approach this from the perspective of like, what are the types of memory that get better, you know, as time goes by? Because there must be something different happening with those uh, in terms of um, how consolidation processes apply to them. So um, we then tried to predict uh, each of these uh, quantities uh, with the anterior hippocampus. Um, and uh, here's that central theme quality um, measured immediately without a delay. Um, and it found a positive relationship with uh, the anterior hippocampus volume. Um, but this relationship intensified uh, after a night of sleep. So um, suddenly um, we are uh, working with, <laughs> this is actually the same image, I think. <laughs> Need to fix that. Um, but um, there is a stronger correlation after a night of sleep than there is um, at uh, time one. So this suggests to us that not only is this sort of high level gist uh, tuned into something the hippocampus is interested in, um, but that it has something to do with uh, the consolidation process. Um, what I'm not showing you are any regressions that concern the other quantities of slide detail or slide gist because that, none of that had anything to do with what we were able to predict using the, the hippocampus. Here's another angle on gist, which is um, novel face viewpoints. And this is uh, inspired by research by Rosanna Olson and Jennifer Ryan in which um, they present people with uh, faces in different, slightly different orientations, rotated, uh, I believe, about 10 or 15 degrees um, across uh, representations. This person's shown the same way every time, and they are tested on a repeat viewpoint. This person is shown the same way every time and shown at a new viewpoint. Here, they're, they're studied at different angles. With, you, you get the idea. So they're crossing the variation in head position during study. Uh, and crossing that with variation in head position at, at test. Um, what they found is that um, in patient HC who has uh, uh, um, congenital uh, problems with his hippocampus, um, his performance was um, poor in, in terms of um, the variable positions, but was about as good as everybody else for the fixed positions. And so the implication here is there's something special about looking to those new viewpoints um, that the hippocampus might be contributing um, that enables you to generalize between the specific images that you've uh, encountered and new ones that would have perceptual information that resembled older information but wasn't quite the same. So um, I thought this um, was an interesting finding, but what really got me turned on to it 
was the fact that uh, in 2009, uh, researchers discovered essentially this new fiber track um, from the anterior hippocampus um, to the fusiform gyrus area, suggesting there might be some special uh, privileged connection to the anterior part of the structure in terms of face processing. So um, here's how people did the um, tasks they performed, um, which I don't have time really to go into, unfortunately. Uh, people were um, uh, looking at faces that they recognized uh, from a task, and they were quite similar to um, ones they'd already seen. Um, the old friends task uh, was a task in which all of the exemplars were different than the ones that they had studied, uh, but um, uh, some were more different than others. And you had to find the one that was most like the, the one they remembered, like recognizing an old friend among strangers. Um, we did versions of this that required memory, and we did versions of this that involved actually looking at the target and looking at the exemplars um, at the same time. And we found uh, that the anterior hippocampus uh, was again a predictor, um, but specifically when we were dealing with these new angles. Um, so if we were uh, working with uh, an original fixed angle of uh, the facial presentation, it had no predictive power, um, which suggests that the structure is really somehow um, contributing to the integration of uh, various fixed positions into a more flexible representation that can be viewed from a, a variety of, of uh, perspectives. Um, and I think that fits with this idea that the structure is really maybe performing some kind of synthesis of uh, exemplars that um, could be useful to people. Um, curiously, there was no predictive power of posterior hippocampus in any of the face tasks. Uh, and when we presented people with upside down faces, um, which is a class of stimuli that are um, perceptually uh, well matched, um, but um, uh, not processed by the fusiform face area to the same degree, um, we didn't find any uh, similar predictive effects. So this seems like uh, perhaps um, uh, really a effect that tunes into face specific processing. Okay, the third and last way I will um, describe hippocampal gist is a little study involving written passages. Uh, this is the written passage of oh, this work is um, um, by my uh, graduate student, Julie Tseng. Uh, this is a passage about the Middle Ages and uh, cities in the Middle Ages. I don't expect anybody to be able to see this, but just to give you a delightful excerpt, um, we'll start with the first paragraph. In the Middle Ages, cities were growing larger and larger, but had many problems. The Middle Ages were about a thousand years ago. You probably know them as the time of knights with long lances on horseback. These fights were called jousts. And it goes on to describe uh, different problems that were experienced in these cities before concluding at the end that there were many problems. Um, people worked them out in cities today, although they still have problems are much better places. Okay, so lovely little essay. Um, we were interested in um, the degree to which people were picking up on the high level semantic structure of this um, when we asked them to perform a verbal recall of the story. Um, and sure enough, we got some people who really latched on to that high level structure and made use of it. So this person says, some of the cities back a thousand years ago from the middle age were overpopulated. People lived very close to each other. There's a fire in London that started in a bake key, killed almost 700 people in the city. Uh, people's living condition was really poor. They just threw garbage out of their window into the street. So they're, they, they're working in uh, details that were actually shown into the story here, but they're doing so in a way that's at least somewhat related to the like, uh, high level concepts that they're presenting. So to juxtapose, here's another person's uh, response. There were a lot of nights. In old cities, there weren't a lot of horses. The houses were close together. Garbage was thrown in the street. Many houses caught fire. Earlier days, people were sick with disease. They needed horses. London, <laughs> jaunt. So uh, there's ingredients there, but it's not actually well integrated in any way. They haven't got the gist, really, of what this story was about. So um, my colleague, John Kirby, uh, had put some effort into characterizing uh, this um, information that exists within the stories in terms of um, main ideas, which I've highlighted here in red. Cities were growing larger but had problems. 
there were not enough houses. Um, and we represent the, those here as like high level main ideas and at the top level is themes like cities had problems. Then at the lower levels, uh, there were important details um, that you know, justified or supported some of those main ideas. And at the lowest level, we had what we described as uh, seductive details, uh, like the fact that um, there were these jousts that involved knights. It's got nothing to do with the story, but people really get <laughs> sucked into that one. Um, so uh, in our recall of people's, um, or I should say in our scoring of people's recall, we looked for the total number of nodes that they recalled. So we actually itemized all the different bits of information in the story and just checked off whether they were getting it right or not. Um, we also looked at the sequence with which people were giving us these things. Was it that they started with little details and then worked their way up, or was it they went and gave us the main theme and then they gave us lots of little examples? And then finally, we looked at the ratio of high level to low level details in terms of the total count that um, people contributed. So um, as a starting point, we, we, just to make sure everyone was able to read this, uh, administered a, a reading comprehension questionnaire called the, the Nelson Denny. Uh, and that surprised us right off the bat because that was correlated with left anterior hippocampus volume. Um, so, but that stands to reason, perhaps, you know, if our ideas are right about just um, that having a good representation of the gist is gonna help you understand uh, the material that you're, that you're reading. Another thing that surprised us is the bottom-up recall um, predicted a larger anterior hippocampus. Um, and that is to say you're starting with the details and working up towards the, the main ideas. And I still haven't quite wrapped my head around that. I think it might be that uh, they have in their head a good representation of the big idea they're trying to get across and maybe they're deferring the delivery of that big idea until they've presented ideas, I should say details, to, to sort of support it. Um, but I uh, have to think about that some more. Um, but then um, the uh, most exciting to us analysis uh, was that the ratio of anterior to posterior, that is to say the, 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 the more that your hippocampus is anterior um, meant that the more the details you present are at the gist level. Um, and so, uh, this is uh, represented in terms of proportions, um, but I think uh, really gets at this uh, notion that we're talking about tipping the balance of the way that information is represented in the hippocampus and how this um, ultimately results in um, a delivery of, of verbal recall, which is already quite a complex process. You've got information, you're making executive decisions about how to organize and deliver it, um, but that's our, our current take. So from these little studies, um, I am saying that the anterior hippocampus is predicting really integration over a few different classes of things, such as naturalistic events from this slideshow, uh, phase viewpoints, and a short written essay. Um, we are looking at a number of other different interpretations of GIST uh, to see uh, how those pan out as well, so this list may, may grow, but um, it, it seems fairly consistent in this respect. So that's um, exciting from the perspective that I feel like we're getting closer to understanding what this um, brain structure is actually contributing as opposed to, uh, as you might take away from the first thing I showed you, where it was negatively predicting memory, just thinking that it's like this dead weight that's slowing down the posterior hippocampus from like making you do well on, on memory tests. So uh, in this last section, um, I wanna talk about how that idea then plays forward into what we might anticipate for the experience of individuals having more of this anterior hippocampus, as many people do. You can look at different people's brains and the ratios vary considerably. Um, what does this mean in terms of how that organism navigates the world, thinks? It's um, just to characterize this problem a little better. Um, let's imagine that we're just um, left to our own devices, sitting in an empty room. And um, as we are thinking, um, our thoughts kind of jump around randomly. So, you know, we start off thinking about uh, when is this going to end? And eventually we start wondering about um, what we're going to have for dinner tonight. And then uh, we think about how glad we are we didn't waste time watching the Super Bowl uh, and so on. Uh, so um, it's essentially a random uh, traversal of um, what I call mental state space. Um, here's the hypothesis, which is that memories 
maybe sort of attractors in this space that can like capture your thoughts for a little while. So um, you know, you might be thinking about something um, like, um, you know, oh, I have to work on that paper tonight, and then it sends you down this rabbit hole of like, uh, oh, geez, um, I was supposed to get a draft of my thesis to my advisor um, yesterday, and now you know your thoughts really kind of circle around things that are related to that before eventually you escape and go back to your random traversal of, of state space. So the, the notion here is it's, it's an attractor on a manifold surface. Um, and the bigger picture here is this manifold surface is really a representation of how we think. Maybe I think differently than other people uh, because of my large or not large uh, anterior hippocampus. And I've never looked, by the way. I have a scan, but I just I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> So um, the intuition would be that if you have a larger anterior hippocampus, you have a greater degree of synthesis, um, which has resulted in more just memories, that you're gonna dwell in for a longer time and you're gonna have fewer transitions in thought because you're gonna be stuck in these attractor states. So to test these ideas, um, I downloaded the Human Connectome Project data set uh, from their 7P scanner. Um, which is a wealth of uh, resting fMRI uh, data expressed over time. Um, but um, researchers have sort of gotten into this kind of problem by looking at what they characterize as, as the chronectome, um, and they're trying to uh, assess whether there are some metastates that might be stable within a long time series. It's a very complicated technique that I'm not going to get into because we're not going to do anything that complicated. Um, but I do want to describe these little blobs at the bottom. These are uh, networks identified uh, through group ICA of the entire 1,200-person um, human connectome project data set. And so uh, we have very high confidence that these are real networks that exist in people and um, that they are quite commonly found uh, within people. Um, so we're going to hang on to these well-defined networks uh, for our own purposes and not worry about the complex chronectome stuff that um, these other guys have, have worked on. Um, instead, we're going to develop a, a procedure um, which is uh, really focused on time point discovery, um, which is a little bit backwards from how we would normally do a study, where um, we're starting with time points and we're trying to discover spatial patterns, uh, at least in uh, fMRI. Um, Instead, here, we're taking spatial patterns, these well-defined networks, and trying to move back to time and say, like, when is something interesting happening in time with these networks? We're going to try and um, establish psychological relevance here. Um, and this is, I think, a problem for um, many studies that are, are diving into these resting data sets, is they're not really grounded in anything that's meaningful to people. It's all just sort of brain math. And so it's plausible that that math could explain um, properties of how the brain works, but without linking it to behavior or cognition, I, I feel it's a little unanchored. Um, then, uh, after we've used the movie data, we're going to try and link that movie data to resting data so that we can then interpret what's going on in the resting data as its own stand-alone domain. And finally, um, turn back to the hippocampus and see whether our ideas about GIST can explain any of the dynamics that we're, we're going to see. So the human connectome data set has 184 people, four movie runs, four rest runs. It's great to have this much data. Um, and uh, with each of these networks, for each run, um, we can characterize how active that network is at each point in time. How highly expressed is it? And so um, that's essentially a reflection of whether the whole group of underlying voxels is, is co-active at the same time. And if we do that, we get this nice time course throughout the uh, fMRI scan of how active that whole network is. And we can do this for each of the networks so that we're going to get a, a number of vectors, each one corresponding to a different node. And um, we can then uh, characterize the, the uh, person's fMRI data in terms of the rising and falling of these networks. Uh, we chose a 15-node solution for this. And um, once we had reduced the data set in this way, um, we needed to go a little further um, and uh, reduce the dimensionality to a way that we could easily compute distance um, metrics. 
Um, this is easier to understand if I uh, just display it to you here um, using, um, we use what we call, a, a, or not what we call, what is called a TSNE algorithm, um, which takes high dimensionality data sets and reduces them to, uh, in this case, uh, as few as two dimensions. So um, here we have uh, one person uh, who's taking um, a resting state scan and um, this dot and its movement represents um, the change from moment to moment in the pattern of all of the networks that are active at any point in time. And so um, it's fair to characterize larger jumps as um, bigger differences between um, the network state at one point in time to the network state at another point in time. Um, and uh, we think that um, these uh, kind of contiguous segments are really interesting because they're, they're really, it's really quite clear when you've moved out of one spot and into a new spot. Um, so we, we characterize these as thought worms um, because um, they, they seem to, uh, particular when we get into psychological validation, have some um, conceptual um, contiguity to them. So uh, we define these uh, breakpoints um, by just looking at the distance from one point in time to the next. So here's uh, that distance metric on the y-axis and then here's time over in seconds. And uh, we just use a peak finding algorithm to spot all the moments when there has been some big jump. And we set a threshold for how big that jump needs to be um, based on just looking at the distribution of values in this. And we set our threshold around here, about three, um, because it seemed pretty clear there was an elbow around this point. And there was something different about the um, distribution um, once you get past uh, that point. This is not a normal distribution. Um, so uh, having done so, we can look at the resting state scans. Here's our 183 participants all stacked on top of each other and then over time. And every dot on this plot is one of those peaks. So it looks like snow here, uh, and it is. Um, and I present this just to juxtapose against the movie scans, uh, which I will show you here. And what I love about presenting the data this way is like it's clear how much structure there is to this. People are all watching the same movie and you can just visually spot the moments in time when they all agree uh, that something new is, is going on. Um, but so the movie stimulus is inducing the structure and the, the sort of burning question is like, what is going on at these moments to generate this like consistent shift in the manifold across people? So to try and understand this, um, what I'm gonna do is, um, play for you segments of this movie uh, where there's high levels of group alignment. And every time there's a, a high group alignment point, you're gonna hear a bell, uh, which indicates a lot of people have just had a transition. So uh, see while you're watching this uh, if there are any regularities that jump out to you that could explain those transitions. What I enjoy about this section is there's all kinds of perceptual change happening here. Flipping back from one perspective to another, but not a lot of those.
PM and to any of those partners who may have been insulted as the case that they were. As for any charges stemming from the breach of security, I believe that's their summary of this report. I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. I don't understand. Which part? You serve recognition. I believe I pointed out some pretty gaping holes in your system. Excuse me, ma'am? Yes. Mr. Zuckerberg, I'm in charge of security for all computers on the Harvard network, and I can assure you of its sophistication. In fact, it was that level of sophistication that led us to you in less than four hours. Four hours? Yes, sir. That would be impressive, except if you had known what you were looking for, you would have seen it written on my door room window. The big virtual address and a page size of 256 bytes. The system uses one-level page tables that start at address at 400. Maybe your DNA is using the system. The first two pages are reserved for hardware tags, etc. Assume page table entries have eight status bits. The eight status bits would then be... Anybody? Let's see, we have our first amendment. Or, Mr. Zuckerberg, I remember we were trying to pick up this class. One dollar bit, one dollar bit. One reference here. Thank you for mentioning this. That is correct. So, maybe as you were watching this, you felt like at those dings there was something you could characterize as, as going on. But um, really, uh, it's an empirical question as to like, if we can um, define uh, what feels like it has some structure to it. Um, and uh, the first thing we did uh, was to um, get, our, um, get several expert raters in the lab to go through the film and identify time points that corresponded to some shift in the conceptual circumstances of, of what was going on. And these are the procedures that are used by Jeff Zaks, who's currently very interested in like event transitions in films. Um, so when we did that, um, we came up with these time points, uh, which if you squint at it, can kind of like you can draw them down and see uh, that there might be a large number of events that kind of follow those points. But we tried to do this a little more um, statistically. Um, in particular, uh, we took um, peak volumes and distinguished baseline ones from this old step distance plot. So I've already showed you how we got these uh, peaks that I was talking about. Um, we then also used a peak finding algorithm uh, to define baseline points when uh, there was really nothing going on. Um, and then juxtapose uh, what's happening at these uh, points in time. Um, we then characterized uh, the variance explained in terms of R squared. So uh, here's what you see when we apply these criteria to various um, possible explanatory variables. Um, events explain a huge amount of the variance. Uh, it's an R squared value of over 0.5, which you just never see in fMRI. So I think this is a really big explanatory component of the, of the effects. Um, micro events um, are ones that uh, concern uh, smaller scale things like sets of actions that conclude and end at different points in time in the film. Um, they also explained a reasonable amount of variance, not quite as much, um, but uh, we censored these out uh, because they often co-occur with when the larger events are, are taking place. Um, so we call that masking here, um, and you can see we've got this waterfall graph where um, the uh, event uh, casts a shadow over points in time when um, this also might be uh, co-occurring. We wanted our, our um, uh, predictors to be independent of each other in time. Um, we did the same thing with cuts. They had a fair amount of explanatory power, about um, 0.3, um, but when we masked them, uh, they had almost none left, um, probably because cuts often happen at the end of a big idea or an event that might be taking place. Um, similarly, um, uh, for every frame in this film, um, because this is part of this big data set, um, they had gone through the trouble at the Human Connectome Project of labeling every object that was uh, in that frame. And so we were able to characterize a, a delta vector of like things changing semantically in time. And that was a really great predictor, almost as good as events until we masked it with events and then it didn't explain, well, still pretty good, about 10%. Um, uh, similarly, we had an estimate of perceptual energy a change from one frame to the next, um, and uh, this uh, totally disappeared after masking, 
And then there's this boring stuff. Um, motion uh, unhappy went away um, as soon as we uh, covered those um, higher explanatory variables. So um, our next point, having established that, okay, this seems to have some grounding in, in the conceptual space occupied by the participants who are viewing these stimuli. Um, and uh, therefore, um, we're going to um, try and use this to understand what's going on in data where we don't have the luxury of that film playing in the background. So we're going to try and link this to the resting data. So one approach is to say, we can look at each of these different participants and say, people who had a lot of transitions up here, did they also have a lot of transitions down here? Um, and if this is a real stable measure of anything, then hopefully there's some trait levelness uh, to it. And there sure was. Uh, we found that they were very correlated, even though they're um, totally separate data. Um, second approach was um, let's try and take these baseline and peak time points. Here we go. Um, and compare voxel-wise what's going on in the brain. So now we are doing the typical thing where we go from time points to brain maps and then doing a subtraction. Um, and we're trying to see if we get the same result for the subtraction for movies as we do for rest. Um, and this is a weird thing to do with resting state data because we have no time points to feed into this other than what we come up with uh, with our brain math. Okay, when we do this, we get some regions. Uh, we start with the posterior cingulate here, which is a great region to discover because um, in past work, uh, it's been found to tune uh, what's called network metastability, which is to say it can kind of dissolve the strength of with which um, your state is locked in one place. So when this turns on, it's possible for the network to then transition to another state as opposed to being just stuck. And it's also psychologically been linked to having a role in spontaneous thought. So not a bad region to find. Um, the insula also seems to appear. Um, it, uh, has been implicated in the switching of uh, one network to another. So for it to appear at points in time when there are network transitions um, is, is um, encouraging. And then finally, uh, lateral parietal cortex, um, which uh, Patrick has had some interest in um, in terms of its uh, contributions potentially to memory. Um, and uh, notice it's, it's actually a blue region here, meaning that it indicates uh, it's more on in the baseline states uh, than when there are transitions. So it's actually maybe holding you in a state. Your attention is uh, being activated to lock you in one spot and prevent you from drifting off uh, to somewhere else. That's how I interpret that particular contribution. But then here we also have the posterior hippocampus. Uh, and uh, this I think is really exciting because it's um, um, showing us that there's activity here uh, at these moments when we're jumping to a new state, as opposed to being held in one state by an attractor, which is the presumed role or the hypothesized role of the anterior, um, possibly meaning that um, it's performing its separation role. It's taking uh, similar circumstances and then noticing that conceptual boundary and then splitting it off and packaging it into something new that we can form into uh, a memory. So um, it's interesting to uh, reflect on how its role might be different to that of the anterior hippocampus. Okay, so this takes us to our last step here, which is to go back to this original hypothesis. We were thinking a larger anterior hippocampus might mean that there are uh, more spontaneous recalls and therefore uh, fewer transitions. Uh, and uh, of course the um, hippocampus, uh, sorry, the anterior hippocampus does predict a lower transition rate, uh, especially the anterior part. So the um, anterior predicts, um, uh, it's a small but reliable effect, thank goodness we have a lot of people. Um, and then if we do our ratio trick, uh, we find that a larger posterior relative to anterior, um, which is independent of the overall size of the hippocampus, is a reason I like this uh, metric, um, is uh, quite reliable. So from this section, um, we have further support for this idea of functional dissociation. Um, from the second section, um, I hope that you were convinced that the anterior may have a role in some kind of synthesis, that just 
seems to be coalescing in terms of how we're defining it around that, that particular idea. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, in this last section, um, linking the anterior hippocampus to um, what we think is a really important neurocognitive marker in uh, thought that we might be able to capture just by looking at, at resting state scans. So um, directions that we can take all this, um, starting with the observation, I think that the anterior hippocampus is underweighted in the clinical literature. And this is perhaps because um, particularly when so much of the neuropsychology on the hippocampus involved um, uh, temporal lobe uh, and hippocampal resections, those resections were performed um, from the front back. And so you usually lost the anterior portion of your hippocampus and preserved your posterior part. And uh, researchers uh, or, or um, clinician scientists would often find that uh, losing a little bit of your anterior part didn't really have any big different uh, impacts on your long-term memory until you got fairly far back. Um, and uh, that may have been because they were using really different memory measures than we're using here. These are weird um, measures, and they're very complex, and uh, they need to be complex in order to have sufficient complexity the structure could be operating on to um, describe things in a um, just kind of way. Um, so uh, it may be that this earlier literature uh, was not appreciating the, the role that it had that we're now proposing here. Um, also contributing to this uh, perspective, um, from the Morris water maze, uh, this graph is a little bit complicated, but what it's showing here is that um, uh, exactly this pattern, if you, if you lesion the hippocampus um, moving from front to back, uh, things really only get bad uh, once you get uh, somewhat far back and there's only like 20% of the posterior part of the hippocampus left. Uh, by contrast, um, if you lesion from the back forwards, things are bad almost right away and um, it uh, uh, doesn't uh, have as large an impact how close you get to the, to the front. So um, those produced converging evidence of uh, this idea that the anterior wasn't all that important. And I think it's an opportunity now maybe to revisit um, some clinical cases applying interesting new designs uh, to see whether we've been overlooking things for um, a number of uh, decades. Um, so that's one direction. Um, I also want to try and find converging evidence for um, this um, uh, idea. Um, it predicts there should be some uh, sensitivity of synthesis and our transition metrics um, to loss of the anterior hippocampus in particular. Um, and uh, I'm interested in some other populations. I have a collaboration with um, Kate Harkness, who's involved in the, the National Canbine Project, some of you may know about, um, where uh, we're tracking um, markers of depression and trying to predict um, who's going to recover and, and not. Um, and then uh, another question is whether these transitions that we're identifying are actually diagnostic of this and other disorders. Um, so uh, it's, it's fun to think of if this really is representing breaks in thought, that mentation rate, as we characterize it in the behavioral sense, may be related to these differences in brain activity. Uh, and therefore, um, people with um, ADHD may have a large number of transitions. People with depression who are ruminative and really stuck in these attractor wells uh, may have very few transitions. So that's an interesting point for us going forward. Um, and uh, finally, further exploration of individual differences. I'm running long, so I won't dwell on that. But um, that's all I have for you. Um, thanks for your attention. Thanks to uh, these uh, wonderful students and uh, the Human Connectome Project for making all these data available and then my sponsors. Take your questions. Especially in the in the posterior part, actually, it's it's yeah, so interesting. That's the question that that's what I wanted to kind of probe is that was there a differentiation between the posterior? Mm -hmm. We did the blood bank study. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm not on this study, but I know that that there are participants in the Kenby network who've tried to like replicate this and are finding the posterior effect. Um, 
And that's what's been reported previously also. Um, but I haven't, I haven't presented uh, any of my own depression data yet. I don't know what we're going to find there. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's interesting to think of that in terms of the balance of what anterior and posterior might be contributing. You know, if posterior is helping you like split up in package situations, whereas anterior is holding you in one place, if you've, all you've got is the thing that's holding you in one place, then you're really going to get stuck there. So, you know, um, that balance of those two regions may be really um, important for how those thought dynamics would play out. That's a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the second question I had is that, so you are ascribing it to strictly to hippocampal function, but I'm wondering the function of the hippocampus that you pointed out earlier on, very dependent upon interconnections and input from the cortex and the, and the amygdala. Yeah. Well, um, uh, you know, we are not able to measure all aspects of the circuit. In terms of the volumetric predictions, the hippocampus is a good target because it's a spot where we would expect dynamic changes in volume because of neurogenesis effects. It's one of the spots where you can actually have new neurons be born and stick according to um, whatever's going on with memory. So um, it's really more of a marker in that case. And yeah, you could generalize it. But the, thing, the, one, the one thing I would say about that is that um, the cortical regions that are connected to the hippocampus are dynamically shifting. And uh, they may not be the common anchor point. It might be the hippocampus is, um, although it's not acting alone, um, is the, the uh, one point that engages a variety of different um, uh, combinations of cortical inputs um, that, um, uh, so that would be the consistent point in that. So if you have different functions in the anterior part and the posterior part, it's very important how, how, do, you, how do you draw the line? Yeah. How, how do you do that? Yeah, it's a great question. And, um, you know, uh, I've advocated for uh, a few different conventions. Um, one is the use of the uncle apex. So um, the hippocampus has a kind of like bend to it. It comes down like this in an arc and then it folds over on itself. And then right at that nub, it's very visible in a, in a um, um, excuse me, a coronal scan. Uh, so you can see the, the point at which the last part of the uncus is visible and then it disappears. So uh, if we split it here, um, then we are using the most obvious landmark that makes it possible to be the most consistent with what other labs are, are doing. Um, so at least we can be talking about the same quantity. Now there's nothing about that point that necessarily reflects the intrinsic internal architecture of the hippocampus. So um, you know, it's, it's just that we can find it in a way and talk about it. Another thing you can do is to talk about proportions. So we can say, let's take the anterior 35% of the structure and juxtapose that against the posterior 35%. And this is now determined based on like the length um, that you can measure in the Y plane, for example. Um, so if you look at a sagittal image, like um, going from front to back. Um, so that proportion method, if you look over a large group, um, works out to be like kind of the same thing as um, the um, uh, 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 actual manual segmentation approach, but it's, it's um, it's not one to one. Um, and so those approaches are um, both really hacks uh, to deal with um, the fact that all we have is like high level system, like um, whole brain information. But uh, what some researchers are now doing is um, running resting state scans and uh, using the um, connectivity of each voxel within the hippocampus. Uh, to attach it to a more anterior um, set connectivity pattern or a more posterior connectivity pattern. And they find, um, uh, using this approach, uh, functionally defined boundaries within the structure. And we can't talk about exactly what makes those boundaries happen, but we know that they're there. And um, what's interesting about those is they actually line up really nicely with the, um, the two approaches that I just described. Um, 
But what's further interesting about them is that you don't have to stop at two, actually. You can um, uh, break up the hippocampus in um, a number of ways, and uh, you unfortunately have to, um, based on the statistical approaches that are currently used, you have to define how many pieces that it should be broken up into. And so uh, there are good solutions for up to five components to each hippocampus right now. And so uh, that includes the anterior posterior part, but then also like medial lateral portions of like the, the body and, and so on. So you can go pretty far down that rabbit hole. And um, for now, we're, stinking, we're sticking with this most simplistic um, uh, approach to it, uh, which we think uh, maximizes our, um, our power. Uh, and you know, in the two state solution consistently appears for, um, um, for those um, uh, functionally defined separations. Um, so yeah, future research opportunities exist for those who want to define the five functional contributions of hippocampal regions and um, uh, who knows what, what lies there. Um, could you say a bit more about how this distinction maps onto the uh, more traditional left hemisphere, right hemisphere mm. distinction yeah. in memory and or spontaneous thought? Yeah. Um, right. So I think our spontaneous thought findings are lateralized and I can't even remember how they're lateralized. Um, and the memory findings in the middle part of the talk are lateralized, but maybe sometimes to the hemisphere that you might expect and other times to the hemisphere you might expect, but you would also expect that a person's left anterior hippocampus and their right anterior hippocampus should be pretty uh, highly correlated in terms of uh, volume. But yeah, you're seeing what look like hemispheric, sort of a shading of uh, relationship, more with one side than the other, I know there are genetic uh, uh, influences uh, too. So how, how, does, how do you see this playing out? What are the possibilities? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, in a bunch of these studies, we had specific hypotheses based on the fact that it was more visual or verbal, like the classic left-right hemisphere distinctions. But, uh, and so we pre-registered some of those laterality questions. But in those registrations, we also said, um, you know, if there is above a correlation of uh, some high value, like 0.8 or something, that we would collapse across the hemispheres and then use a merged representation. Um, and um, I think it is generally the case that we don't see as high a correlation as we expect. Um, and so we have been turning to the, the bilateral um, situations. Um, and uh, there, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. I can't claim that I would always predict which side it shows up on, but sometimes it makes a lot of sense. Like, for example, the face uh, effects are left lateralized, and that's where the stronger um, tracks have been identified between anterior hippocampus and fusiform face area. So, um, yeah, I think the laterality effects uh, like just are kind of slippery. I know that sometimes they pan out for people and very often they, they don't. And I, I wouldn't claim that that's the strongest part of the set of predictions I'm able to make. Yeah, so our, um, if you were looking at the points in time where there's like an important high level concept that's been introduced maybe, does that map onto the activity of the hippocampus at that time? Is that sort of the idea? Yeah, um, we, haven't, um, we haven't taken that approach. It's an interesting idea. Um, the, um, I, I think you would uh, need to come up with um, a robust scheme that raters can agree on, on like how do we find those time points. But I think that's very doable and I think it would be a really great research question. Yes, time for one more question. 